Alright, so this is World Building Episode 3, and this episode I think I am going to sort of properly start the series, because obviously the first episode, which I released a really long time ago, was kind of just an explanation of what I hoped to do. The second episode caught you guys up on what I'd done, and now this episode I'm actually going to properly start off. I just want to preface this episode by saying that um, this series is going to be about, or the goal of this series is for you, the viewer, whoever you are, to create, construct, build, define your own fantasy world. And so throughout this, I would really love it if you guys worked along with me. I mean, you can totally just watch these for the enjoyment or understanding that I may be able to offer, that kind of thing. But ideally, you guys would work along with me and start constructing your own fantasy world. So... Lesson one, episode one, is going to be based on, uh, how do I say it? It's going to be based on geography and an understanding of geography. And then we may get very mildly into how geography affects cultures in your world, but we'll probably save culture distribution for maybe next episode. Also, obviously, I've spoken about being a cartographer, someone who draws maps, and if you guys are at all interested in getting videos on map art and map drawing and map design along with this, if anyone watching this is interested in that, just shoot me a message or comment on this video because I see all the comments. Um, and I can totally put those out. I can totally break down how I draw maps, how I create coastlines, how I section up areas, how I deal with climate, all that sort of thing. But for the sake of this episode, we're just going to focus mainly on geography. Now, um, yeah, okay, so now basically I am going to be looking at the world map and talking about different areas. So I'm just going to break down the world map for you guys. We're going to start at the top of the map in the right, and I'm really sorry, but my recording, my screen recording software isn't working, so I'm just going to have to put up images on the screen using an editing program and hopefully you guys can bear with me but you won't be able to follow my mouse around. I am sorry about that, I'll try to get it fixed. Um, now in the top of the screen, on the, or on the top of the map, basically across the top you have what I refer to as the cold lands. Now the cold lands are on the north. We've already talked about um, Croesus or this planet being in a fixed orbit. So the sun faces one direction and the planet always maintains one side facing the sun. So the cold lands are the side that face away from the sun. These cold lands border the lands of eternal darkness, which are the lands that get no sunlight and cannot support any kind of life. Now, on the far left here in the cold lands, I have this kind of ice coast, which you can obviously crack icebergs. Most of this will be ice, not actual physical land. Although you can see further north mountains, which do suggest that there is land trapped under there. Now, I created this bar of cold land across the top as an area of unexplored wonder in the world. I think that including areas of wonder that could be explored in the future that your story or your role-playing game or whatever you're creating could explore is a really good idea. So I've created some things of interest, which I will obviously delve more into. These are the hidden seas, because these seas become clogged with ice, but they are actually great ice seas. There's also the ruins of lost frozen empires of the old ice kings. There is, in the middle here, the gate to the far north, which is like a choked frozen river channel filled with like frozen sunken ships that um, I might pull up a picture of. There's these beautiful photos from, I think, the first expedition to Antarctica of the ship that sunk, and that's kind of what evoked those ideas to me. Now, if you follow along to the right, you have the Biotor Peninsula, which is this region here with um, these mountains and sort of fjord-type formations, a lot of cold boreal taiga forest. This area is kind of the Norway analogue in my world. There are clansmen here, similar to Vikings. I will obviously get into that a lot more with culture. Um, you follow along this frozen coastline as it dwindles away from forest into wasteland again, and you get this island. This island is called the Isle of the Goliath, and the Goliath are the sort of last remnants of the old Ice King empires. Obviously, I'll dig more into them in culture. Now, following down, the top of the Cold Lands actually borders onto this big sort of continent on the right called Ayem. And Ayem is sort of like Asia, 
parts of Africa. It's its own thing. Now, you've got up the top, I actually have split the area into a lot of there's kingdoms in these mountains. You can see hollows separated by rivers. You can see this big sea here. Lots of little forests, lots of islands. And the idea is that these are sort of feudal barbarian-like kingdoms, which I can do a lot with. Now, these hills create sort of a border to this spinifex, grassy, spiky, prickly, like, frigid wasteland where nothing lives except the Kazis, who are a race of subhumans who dwell below the surface. I'll get into that when I do my race video. I'm really excited for that video, actually. I may do it. I have lots of tips on creating really cool fantasy races that are unique, because I get very sick of elves and dwarves. Just really quick, there will be no elves, dwarves, little hobbit folk, anything like that in this. I am a massive advocate for creating your own fantasy races. Um, now, the next area, if we move down, obviously as the continent grows warmer, as it gets more towards the um, molten side of the planet that faces the sun, you get more temperate environments, you have areas like Aizenkai, the Aizenkai Empire, and then the Empire of the River Lords in here nestled under these mountains. These mountains are called the Mountains of the Octan. They are where humans originated from. Again, I will do them in the Race, the Race Family Tree um, video. Now, these areas are sort of more like average levels of climate. You've got oak and pine forest. You've got like warm plains and lowlands, that kind of thing. You have this massive waterless wasteland, the deserts and dry grasses of the Zanax area, which is this really cool area. The Zanax area are these like tribal, like clan camel riding guys in bright colored clothes who are the only ones who know how to navigate between the hidden wells in these wastelands. And so they have a unique power there. Moving further down, you have a, um, a big mountain range called the Ring of the World, which creates a rain shadow. And the rain coming from the south gets trapped. And that's why you have these, um, these jungles on the other side, um, which are all very fertile, very hot jungle. You've got a couple of kingdoms in here, that kind of thing. Um, moving, and again, small islands here, another desert kingdom down here. Um... Moving over, or moving back across the map, we have right down at the bottom Meridanus, which is kind of the Australia analogue I've already talked about. This, again, is very close to the heated side of the planet. Actually, Meridanus is the one continent which the bottom half of it becomes molten earth, is inexplorable, uninhabitable. Meridanus is mostly jungle, um, like sort of like floodplains, dry grasslands and deserts. Again, there's a bit of a rain shadow where any moisture gets trapped on the northern side of the mountains and leaves the southern side in desert. And Merid um, then over on this side, we have Tum. And Tum is um, similar to Africa. Again, you have a pretty varied but very hot climate. You've got jungle down the bottom where most of the rain comes from, which feeds into savanna. This big, and then these massive red desert mesas up into more marshland where the, um, the actual level, the height of the land is much lower and the sea floods these plains for hundreds of miles. And then up the top, you have a more sort of European climate forest with um, oak trees and spruce trees and that kind of thing. Um, now in the middle, the main set of islands, Karia, Noknameb and Ariz, Noknameb being the island that we did in episode one. Um, they are very varied in climate. Karia up the top, you have frozen kingdoms. And again, the snow gets trapped on the left-hand side of this mountain range. Then this side, you have a more Mediterranean climate down the bottom. Kingdoms here are similar to Italy or Spain. And again, a more European climate up the top. Kingdoms here being more similar to Scotland or Ireland in climate. Again, Nocnamabe. Um, more of the cold gets caught on the right side of this island because it's obviously shielded by this big mountain range. And so you get a cooler climate, a more Irish, Scottish, English climate. Then below, across this sea, the Trade Sea, you have um, Ariz. And Ariz is a lot of dry grasses. I mean, it does get colder towards its northern tips, but definitely down the bottom we have this huge shattered jungle peninsula, a big swampy sunken peninsula, a desert kingdom, Albayash, that kind of thing. Now I've broken down the map, um, it's incredibly important, I, I believe, when building a world, to consider the, um, the different sort of races, cultures you want to have. Now I've split up this world, I mean it's kind of similar to Earth, but not really. 
but I've made sure to provide myself with a diverse range of climates, which I definitely um, suggest you do. Don't, or I wouldn't limit your world to a single climate, like the sort of Star Wars-esque Hoth is an entire ice planet, or, you know, Tatooine is all desert, that's pretty boring, and it totally works if your world is intergalactic and you can have interplanetary travel, but this world is set in a medieval age, so that's off the table, so I didn't want to limit the environments I had access to. I then considered the, um, the way I'd set up my world being in fixed orbit and knew that everything further south, that it wouldn't be polar, it wouldn't be hot in the middle like our world and cold at the ends, but that everything further south would grow hotter until it became molten and everything further north would be cold. And so any cultures that I wanted to exist in a more European or Northern European climate, I needed to situate an, on an area on the world where they would fit. So you can see that looking at the map as a whole, we have on the far right these barbarian kingdoms that I obviously wanted to be in that climate, but I had to make sure that they were sort of at the same height across the map as Kyria and Nocnamebe, which also had to be in that climate, and at a similar height to the um the strange sort of green forests at the top of Tomb, which I also wanted to be in that climate. So anything you want in a certain climate, you probably want to fit it roughly, considering how, um you know, winds move and rain shadows work and that kind of thing. You want to situate it at roughly a similar height around your globe. And you can see that I've done that with you getting jungle the further south, jungle and desert further south, more temperate lands in the middle with kingdoms like Aizenkai, sort of northern Ariz, that kind of thing. And then also, whenever you have a strong border between biomes, and a perfect example of that is the deserts on one side of this mountain range here in AM, and the jungle on the other side, I would suggest creating a natural border. And a river probably isn't enough. In this case, I did a mountain range because it made sense for rain to be trapped on one side of the mountain range and for the mountain range to leave a rain shadow in the form of a desert on the other side of the mountain range. So whenever you're considering vast changes in climate, a mountain range is a really good way to do that. That's obviously pretty obvious, but um, for example, this mountain range at the edge of AM, on the other side of that there are meant to be black, blasted, sort of basalt deserts, which are part of mythology, no one's ever travelled there, or they're not on scholarly maps. And again, you can see that when I have this colder area up north in AM, I've created a border out of hills into the grasslands below. When I have, again, mountain range can also, mountain ranges can also be used to create mystery. I have a mountain range on the far right here to create a little bit of mystery about the kingdoms and this side of AM, the strange sort of spell priests and like sea gods and that kind of thing, which exist in these frozen blasted northern regions. Again, I've used a mountain range far north with the Biotor Peninsula because I thought, what would stop the inhabitants of the Biotor Peninsula heading north and exploring the north? And um, I think setting up a mountain range, it, for one, explains why there is life on that side of the mountain range because maybe some heat can be trapped, some moisture can be trapped on that side of the mountain range. And it also um, gives a natural barrier for the inhabitants of the Biotor Peninsula. I, um, I, so mountain ranges are used all throughout the map to separate biomes, create mystery, or make sense of biomes. I also definitely recommend using rivers as trade routes if you're going to consider a medieval world. So, I mean, the rivers on this map, which I will get more into when I do individual country and continent breakdowns, but the rivers on this map all exist for a reason. So this big river over here on Tum is um that river is actually the people of the lands of the Impala send their dead along that river on rafts as offerings to this strange entity called the City of Red Mist in the jungle. And the idea of that being that the river serves a purpose story-wise. Or this river over here, where the Khazis live, is um the biggest river in the world and is kind of mythic where the Khazis come from. Where does it flow from? The strange black waters of that river. Um, I think we're going to end the geography video here. Tell me if there's anything you want me to cover. Next video we might dig into culture, or possibly races. Uh, it's kind of up to the like three viewers I have. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. Please, if you have any friends that would like my videos, anyone you think you'd recommend it to, um, do that because it's really difficult to start out as a YouTuber. It's very hard to get views. 
Um, again, thank you so much. I'm sorry about the editing. Obviously, I'm not that skilled of an editor. I'm more of a drawer and talker. Um, thanks again and goodbye. Please leave a like, by the way. Yeah.